60 Minutes with Angela starts right now. In February 2017, Nigeria's foremost independent weekly magazine, Tell, said in its editorial that, quote, the president needs to rescue his gallant war on corruption from a total loss of direction and credibility, end of quote. They also went on to say that the urge of the president to protect Close and loyal aides at all costs is a sad commentary on the direction of the anti-graft war. A cardinal program of his administration. Quote, it is sad because it is at once a departure from the electoral promises of the president and the expectations of the electorate over how the nation shall be governed and the all-important issue of the president's presumed integrity, end of quote. Well, hello and welcome to the program. I'm Angela Ajetumobi. Nusa Igebo is the president of Tel Communications Limited, publishers of Tel Magazine. Today, I'm asking him, in May 2017, if Tell Magazine has changed its opinion about Buhari's failing war. Welcome, Mr. Egebo. Thank you very much for coming on the program again with me today. Thank you, Angela. It's a pleasure. So this is May 2017. Yeah. That editorial I was quoting was written in February. Does Tell Magazine still stand by the contents of that editorial? Of course, the magazine does. And on the content of the editorial. Mm. Uh, nothing has changed? No, nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, subsequent events uh, yes. regarding the war have uh, been more or less confirmed. That distance we converse in the editorial. All right. So we start off with this. You said the president needs to rescue his gallant war on corruption from a total loss of direction and credibility. And, you know, let's look at the reasons why Tell is saying that. Reading that editorial, Tell Magazine comes across as very hostile or critical of the president and his style, especially dismissive of his cautious approach to things. What is wrong with him exercising a little bit of caution? Uh, there's a lot wrong with uh, what I would regard as excessive caution, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cautiousness. When it, it gets to a point where it's no longer pro productive, Remember that uh, when APC, his party, and he himself as a presidential candidate were campaigning late 2014, early 2015, months preceding the election, they were very clear that if they won the election and they formed the government, they were going to be up and running from day one. Yes. And that because they believed at that time the country was uh, in the doldrums, as it were, mm. It needed a government that we leave the country by the scruff of his neck and get it running very fast. Mm -hmm. Like I said in my previous appearance here, yes, they did a lot of talking, but they are yet to walk the walk. Could it be because their perception of what they were going to meet there was shattered by the time they finally got in office, like we're seeing with our dear friend Donald Trump, things are not quite the same when you're on the campaign trail and when you actually get into office. Could that be a factor? 
Yeah, that could be, but in this instance, I think it's just a convenient excuse for not living, to the, not living up to the expectation of the public. Because before you make commitments, before you make pronouncements, at least we know that when politicians, when they are conversing for vote, they, yes. make, they, make, they make all kinds of promises. There are certain promises that the public will hold you to account for. And uh, when you get to office, after you won the election, and you are now telling us that, oh, this is not what, what we meant on ground. Yes. Was not what we expected. Therefore, if we are not where we ought to be as we promised, mm. please, you know, you, have, you need to excuse us. I'm not going to give them that rope. You know, for, for a very simple reason. Yes. You know, the federal government run by the APC told Nigerians that the economy was on the verge of collapse as at May 29, 2015. Yes. When they formed the government. That's what they told us. Yet, what did the government do? It did nothing. On the one hand, you claim that the economy was on the verge of collapse. On the other hand, you did nothing. There was no government for six months because the president took forever to form his cabinet. So how do you really square these two circles? Not forming his government. You know, many would say, many of the president's allies would say, well, you know, this was the result of, you know, a merger of four parties. How do you take care of all the interests that came in to form the APC? Couldn't they be excused on the ground of political permutations and the delays that could have brought to the president's desire to set up a cabinet almost immediately? It's not pleasant for me to say this again, Yes, but it's, it's just a convenient excuse. Because, yes, APC is an amalgamation of different political tendencies, different yes. political parties. But one would have expected that these are pre-election matters that had, I mean, ought to have been discussed, agreed upon, yes. and a consensus reached as to how the spoils of the war will be shared. Will be shared. Mm -hmm. You don't post-election begin to waste time trying to find out who gets what. Yes. You know. So again, that's the internal affairs. Nigerians voted you in to replace PDP based on the promises you made. If you now allow your in internal differences in your party as to uh, how you can ensure a fair sharing of the outcome, then you know you have to take the blame, take responsibility for that. It would seem then that, as far as the magazine is concerned, once anything is said about anyone serving, I'm telling you my feeling from reading that editorial, mm. that once anything is said about anyone serving the president, that person must go. Even if such allegations are malicious, they're unfounded or non-existent because the editorial admits in some cases that, well, you know, politics might be at play. Some people may be victims of some kind of uh, intrigue, but at the same time, you place a lot of blame on the desk of the president. Well, I think, like it is said, what is the source for the goods should be calling the source for the Ganda. Well, the EFCC, this is part of the basis for people's criticism of the way the anti corruption war is being fought. Yes. You are subjecting people to vicious public trial in the media, and you are make, pronouncing them guilty even be, before you are, they are charged before a court of law. That's what you are doing to people you said yeah, you are investigating for corrupt practices. How, how so, are they pronouncing them guilty? Is it not the newspapers that go to town when? Anyone is arrested or... I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Yeah. I was going to bring the edition where I use the quote, but I forgot it. About two months back, I think, uh, sometime in February, March this year, the Abuja High Court, where Justice Gebrekola Wale assist, came out hard on the EFCC. Why was the judge angry with the FCC? There's a case that the FCC brought before Justice Kola Wale, in which about three people were indicted for allegedly laundering about six billion naira, because government funds allegedly got into their hands and they laundered this money. These three people were charged before Justice Gebrekola Wale, and their plea was taken. They pleaded all guilty. Subsequently, ESCC issued a statement saying that these three suspects had been indicted and charged before the same court for laundry 36 billion naira. That was the statement EFCC gave to the press. Of course, the press went, if EFCC issue, issue a statement, yes. you expect the strong press to go amount, to town uh, yes, amount of credibility. Of course, the press went to town. That makes very sensational headlines, yes. cover headlines. 
and you saw your paper. Of course, at the next court hearing, the lawyers to the defendants drew the judge's attention to that discrepancy between what EFC is charged the same three suspects for and the information gave to the public hmm. on the same matter. Two conflicting information. Exactly. So, and uh, the question was, the figure they gave her, was it a mistake? You would have expected that if it was a mistake, maybe a typographical error. Yes. After the publications came out, the newspapers published the statement. It will have a call to someone in EFCC, whoever issue, uh, issue authorized the statement to be issued. Mm -hmm. Look, wait a minute. There's a mistake in this figure. It should be 6 billion, not, not, 36. not 36 billion. But it was never corrected. Even when the matter came before the judge, the lawyer for the for EFCC or the prosecution was at a loss. He himself said he didn't know how this happened. The judge then ordered that EFCC must go back and retract that statement. And until he did that, he was going to suspend the trial of, of, of the case. Did the FCC do so? Of course they did. When the trial of the case resumed again, the defendant's uh, lawyer still made a case that, yes, there was a, the EFCC issued a statement retracting that, correcting that earlier statement, but that they ought to have filed a copy of that statement of retraction before the court. Mm -hmm. And the judge said they were right. EFCC must file a copy of that statement with the court so it can be in the file. Yes. So that's a typical example of subjecting people to vicious media trial. That's why I said what is sourced for the uh, goods should be also be sourced <laughs> for the for the Ganda. I'm not naturally saying that once somebody is accused of anything, the, it, it must be deemed automatically guilty. Yes. Yeah, I mean that is why I for one I criticize the way the way is being fought. I mean our system presumes someone innocent until it's found otherwise by a competent law court. All right. I want to read one of the quotes in that editorial to you. Were the president to demonstrate some modicum of transparency over the issue, he would have sent Lawal back to the Senate instead of giving him what amounts to executive clearance. End of quote. Was a request by the president for further clarification as far as the matter of the SGF is concerned. How does that become executive clearance? The president receives a report from the Senate yeah. and he says this report is signed by three people. Is it a minority report? Secondly, there is no evidence that the secretary to the government of the Federation was allowed to give his own side of the story. This is a right guaranteed by section 36 of our constitution what was wrong with the president calling attention to those what he perceived to be lapses well the answer to your question is provided by the subsequent action of the presidency with regard to the secretary for government uh, babachi Lawa. and this was that it also clearly shows the disarray in the presidency Yes, I mean, the Senate report, initially, the presidency contested it, yes. set up an internal panel made up of, um, I don't know, I think the... The, the NSA, the Attorney uh, yeah, General, you know, and the VP. No, no, no that's the subsequent one, the first one. Okay. He, asked the, he asked the Attorney General to look into the uh, Senate report. Okay. On, uh, on yeah, and and we never knew what the report yes, of the Attorney General was. Yes, and subsequently came said. up to say that, well, you see, uh, this report is... Uh, incoherent is incomplete because it was signed by they were picking at very significant need need picking need picking and why fail to address the substance of the Senate report that the secretary to the federal government essentially abused his office by the way and manner he awarded contracts in respect of the situation in the northeast yes. uh, involving the internally inter inter displaced persons. Yes. That's why I said that the presidency, by their latest action of suspending Lawa, it is on vomit. And this is why people are saying that what you know, does the presidency really know what it's doing? And who runs the presidency? Who makes the decisions? Because you find that today they take a, a position, tomorrow. They take another position contradicting the first one they have taken. You know, and another example I'll give you is Magu, the chairman of uh, Ibrahim Magu. Yes, the you acting know? chairman of the FCC. Yeah, of the of the FCC. I wrote a piece saying the, the the mocking of Magu. Who was mocked by Magu? There are people who think that the Senate the Senate mocked him. It was it's not the Senate that mocked him. Who mocked him? The presidency mocked Magu. How? I'll tell you why. Because, one, you sent Magu the first time, you sent his name to the city for confirmation as substantive chairman of EFCC. Yes. And, of course, the uh, director of state services, DSSS, wrote a security report 
indicting Mago and declaring that the guy, because of what they found out, so it is he did, was that they didn't find him a fit and proper person to hold that office. Based on that, the senator said, well, look, this is the report from DSSS. And they said, you did this, you did this, you did that. Therefore, we are not going to even listen to you. They throw back his nomination to the presidency. And then the presidency set up, asked the attorney general again, yes. Mr. Justice and Baka Malani, to look into the DSSS allegations against Magu. And of course, what we are told is that the attorney general, more or less, yeah, were queried AFCC chairman. So look, these are the allegations made against you. Mm. Can you provide answers? And we were told that he did so. And the attorney general subsequently wrote a report and sent it to the president. We were again told that the president found the report satisfactory. It was on that basis he renominated Magu for the same position of chairman of the FCC. Here is the puzzle, my yes. general. The same DSSS again wrote a report to the Senate saying we are standing by our initial report that Magu is not a fit and proper person to hold that position. Should the DSS have been writing directly to the Senate? No one has really been able to that's tell the question, me that's, that's the question. Valid. That's the question we should be asking the presidency because the DSS, the EFCC, out of the presidency, the chairman of EFCC, the director general of DSSS, report to the president or to the office of the president. So you should be asking the president why, you know, what I found alarming, and a lot of Nigerians, you know, those who were lambasted the Senate, yes. because they, they, they missed the point. You are turning on the Senate as the whipping boy of the whole situation. I mean, the jelly does for Magu, so the Senate is there, the people who are trying to get him out of the place. Nobody is asking, how could the presidency have so spectacularly mismanaged Magu's nomination? Because how will the DSSS dare to write another report to the Senate, more or less challenging the President and Commander-in-Chief, which threw off a question. That letter purportedly sent to the Senate by the President, was it actually sent by the President? Because if the President sent that letter and signed it, yes. and sent it to the Senate, and subsequently, the DSSS write a report contradicting the President, and has his not rule. I have not heard of today that the, the DG of DSS was queried by anybody. You know, so you need to ask yourself, what is going on? Who's in charge? Yeah. Join us again after the it's break. Okay. Hmm, nice question. Angela, that's a great question. It's a good question. It is difficult to respond to that question. That is a serious question. <laughs> Angela, that is a very great question. Great question, Angela. You know, Angela, that's a, that's a very difficult question. That's a great question, Angela. Okay, that's a great question. Angela, um, that's a tough one for me. That's a good question. Good question. 60 Minutes with Angela. Again, answers to every question you always wanted to ask. Welcome back. If you've just joined me, it's 60 Minutes with me, Angela Jetumo, be on my hot seat today. Nosa Igebo, the president of Telecommunications Limited, publishers of Nigeria's foremost independent weekly magazine, Tel. The scenario you raise just brings something to my mind, interagency rivalry. Yeah. Could there be some rift? between Lawal, Brian Magu, yeah. and the boss of, of uh, the DSS, uh, 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 Lawal, Lawal Daura. Daura. Could there be some kind of friction between them? Could it be one has it in for the other? Do we know if they have history together about anything that has well, gone on between yeah, them? Yeah, I wouldn't know whether before they were appointed by the president, there was, some, there was any personal animosity between the two. Uh, individuals. But what is clear is that there is rivalry, a interagency rivalry between the DSSS and the EFCC. Yes. It's very obvious. If you remember last October, when the DSSS... That's uh, October 2016. Yeah, 2016. When the DSSS carried out the mid, uh, midnight race on the homes of some judges, yes. uh, both in the federal capital and elsewhere in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course so much noise was made about it that the judges were corrupt. There was a huge public outcry against the way the DSSS went about it. Although, of course, we, we must also note the fact that there were many out there who, who applauded the DSSS. But the, the huge public outcry prompted the House of Representatives to set, set up a committee, or ask this committee on anti-corruption, I think, to look into the matter. And during the sitting of that committee, one of those that appeared before it was Magu, Ibrahim Magu. And during his own appearance, Magu was 
very unequivocal in condemning those DSSS rates. As a matter of fact, Bagu told the committee in very clear terms that the DSSS was encroaching on its own territory, that financial crime is the major remit, according to the EFCC Act, of EFCC, whereas intelligence is the major remit of DSSS. In other words, so DSSS had no business. Yes, overstepped its bounds. Over, over, overstepped its bounds and said that, oh, you are. You read this judge because you suspected that they were involved in corrupt, uh, in, in corrupt practices. And he said, what the DSS should have done, if you, for your investigation, you thought the judges were corrupt, you should have submitted your report to us, so we'll, we'll take it from there. That clearly shows, that established the rivalry, the animosity between the two agencies and the leaders of the agency. But having said that, that rivalry ought not to have been allowed by the presidency to make the person of the president look uh, ineffective. And that's why people are asking, who is really in charge of, it, of this government? Could the agencies be second-guessing the president? You know, if you appointed me as the head of an agency to fight corruption, with the Nigerian factor, with the way our culture works, you know, I would be stupid to want to go after your friends, your close friends, or your close allies. And that's the way it works. Whether or not you give me instructions to do either, go after my friends or go after my enemies, I will think that I will be making you happy. This is why the corruption was, the, the fight against corruption was dead even before it started. It failed even before it started. Because when you say you are fighting corruption, there should be no sacred cows. There should be no, oh, this is my son, this is my niece, my nephew, my brother, my townsman, my friend. Is um, that the feeling you get in the matter of the SGF? First and foremost, again, I think the problem we are seeing right now is the presidency is not working as one one unit. One unit. You have different factions in the presidency, and therefore these factions are engage in a very internecine war, mm. you know, uh, you know, among themselves. Why do we have the factions? Is it because different parties came to form the? No, APC? I think no, no, no. I think you know, let's call it spade a spade. It's just a reflection of the weakness of the president. The president is not a hands-on person. When you say he's not hands-on, what do you mean? Not hands-on because he doesn't seem to be on top of the day-to-day yeah, day -day activities around his presidency, around his government. To the extent that you now have people within the presidency all juggling for power. It's all about grabbing power for themselves. Mm. Uh, how much power and influence can I wield I will personally? Yeah. All exploiting exploiting the weakness of the president, not being a handsome person. Are you saying weakness because he's going through health challenges or what type of weakness are you talking about? No, I think the head, his, his head condition has only compounded the problem. Uh, for those who know Buhari will tell you that he's not a handsome person. You know, he trusts people, he surrounds, he surrounds himself with people he trusts and more, more than and, the, and delegates, he delegates to them. and give them a free hand. Trusting that they will do what is right and they will do what he wants. Yes. But unfortunately, this is not turning out to be so. So, uh, of course, when the when the Senate first raised the issue, uh, the case of Baba Chilawa, yes. Of course, the faction I'm sure the faction Baba Chilawa belongs to had to fight to Tane to rescue him. That was why they orchestrated that report that the president was not satisfied with the Senate report. Therefore, he was not going to fire ask, him. Yeah, fire him. Mm. But subsequently, what did the Senate, what did the presidency do? The same presidency, what did he do? He suspended Lawa. What has changed? Is it not the same report, Senate report? Those allegations that were contained in those Senate reports that it, that, was, that formed the basis for a suspension by the same presidency who had earlier said that he didn't see any basis for it to do what the Senate was asking it to do. Do you see the presidential investigative panel as a soft landing for the SGF? To me, it's a bloody waste of time. The panel is not necessary. And it's a way to just tell the public that, oh, no, no, look, we are very concerned about the situation. We're yes. trying to do something about it. And let me quickly add this. You see, there's this obsession by Nigerians that, oh, the only corruption that matters or the only corruption that exists in this country and we should all worry about is government officials stealing public money. Mm. That is not the only form of corruption. That is just one form of corruption. There are many forms of corruption. So we are so focused. Oh, this Edosai uh, Gibor was uh, on the in the NPC. He stole a uh, amount of uh, mm. uh, blah blah and all that. But recently, the news broke that the DSSS recruited 
about 400 plus new staff. And out of the 400 new staff, 51 alone came from Casino State. Yes. The state of the president and the state of the DG of the DSSS. The 51 slots allocated to, to Casino State is more than the entire five states of the Southeast. That is a worse form of corruption. And nobody talks about it. I asked Lai Mohammed about this, the Minister for Information. I also asked the President's Special Advisor yes. on it. Yes. Uh, and both of them said the same thing. It was to balance out an imbalance balance in, pre what? in previous Okay, uh, fine. Did they, did, they, did they publish the figures to establish that imbalance? You know, when we challenge what they've done, when the public reacted and said, no, this is wrong. Wrong, yes. Okay, no, 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 please let us explain. So this is the current composition as it is as today. It is today, before we did the recruitment. You can see that from Casino, there's virtually nobody. Therefore, we needed to correct this imbalance. That they are telling us that, oh, it was an attempt to correct the imbalance. is to provide a gay, a convenient excuse for doing something that is, that is patently, patently wrong. And corrupt in a country of 36 states you know a country of many nationalities you are making recruitment to a very important federal intelligence agency like dsss and you give 51 slots to one state and the number for that state is more than like i've said the entire the total for a whole zone the southeast the South there's no way four, you can justify that slots. yeah 44 slots they get 51 for one state in the northwest the total for the Northwest is over about about one hundred and something. Can anything be more corrupt than this? Because somebody is just taking advantage of his position to do a thing like this. But Nigerians don't we talk about it and then we move on. And oh the no side the boss too me, oh crucify him. That's why I'm saying that we are focused so much on public the state of public funds. There are so many forms of corruption. You know, nepotism is corruption. Nepotism, because if I'm, if I'm in a vantage position, maybe as a minister yes. or a DG of a federal agency, and my special advisor is my son, my other uh, personal assistants are my nephew or my nieces, mm. you know, mm. my driver is, uh, is, from my, is, my, is from my street or whatever. Yes. That is corruption. In that situation, it's not, not, it's not about merit now. Yes. It's about, oh, I'm here today, so I must e empower my people. My people, exactly, empower my people <laughs> at the expense of others. So when the magazine speaks of a practical defense of members of the executive, what do you mean? If the president accepts the explanation of anyone who is a member of his staff, yeah. is that wrong? The Senate rejects the nomination of Ibrahim Mangu twice. And then the members, not the president himself, and members of the executive, of the presidency, turn around and say, and those who advise them, yes. including some senior advocates, turn around and say, oh, okay, it doesn't matter whether his, his nomination is confirmed or not, he can stay there in active capacity forever. And you ask yourself, these people, is it because they like the president so much and they are leading him to commit what is clearly illegal or if you want to take it for the unconstitutional? But the law doesn't, the, the law doesn't define how I, many times. No, 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 no. Angela, you see, this is the danger. This is the danger. And I said this before. People are, you see, what has happened in the case of Magu is that people are equating Ibrahim Magu with EFCC and the war against corruption. So I ask the question, if Magu, after he had been taken, subjected to this humiliating nomination process and been turned down twice by the city, decides that, look, I've had enough, I'm, I, I quit. So you shut down EFCC because Magu is not there? Is he the only one that can that fight exactly, the war? Exactly. So you shut down EFCC because Magu is no longer there. EFCC was there before Magu became the chairman. Yes. EFCC will be there when he ceases to be chairman. But when you say and insist that there is no EFCC unless Magu is the chairman, that's what we are saying, that the fight against corruption will really outlive this administration. I doubt it. You doubt it? Yes, because there are no institutions. Because if the next, if the, the president who comes after him or the administration yes. who comes after him, say, ah, uh, Mr. Magu, you have been acting forever. I'm tired of your acting yes. forever. So you need to give way. I'm going to appoint somebody else. Would that be the end of the war against corruption? What about the loss of face of a president? When a president sends a name and, and it's not approved, I mean, if he accepts that rejection, doesn't he lose some face? No, there's no loss of face, Angela. The presidential system will run. It's a give and take thing. 
I mean, how many of the president nominees have been rejected by the Senate? Overwhelming majority of them have been approved by the Senate. It's just a few cases, including that of Magu. So there is no basis for the president to lose face. Again, it's also the Magu also typifies the major failings of the presidency. Which is? Which is, after the, uh, the first failure of yeah. um, uh, Magu's nomination, the presidency ought to have done his own work, ought to have lobbied the Senate, engaged with the senators, whatever the observations they had they about had, yes. Magu, the doubts they had, the, the grievances they had, ought to have been thrashed out before his name was sent for the second time to the Senate. But I don't know the difference. Exactly, but that was not done. So that's why I, I, you know, I raised the issue earlier, that the whole process makes the president look totally ineffective, and that he's not con in control of his government, because how can the president, for the second time, nominate Magu as chairman of EFCs? And the yeah. DSS says, who dare the president? By, by countering that. Countering that. And then nothing happens. So you ask yourself, is it the president that really wrote that letter renominating Magu? Or somebody else. Or somebody else. But claiming that the president did. And if the president did not write that letter, and the letter was purported to have been written by him, and the outcome is one that has brought embarrassment to the president himself and the office of the president. Has anything happened? These are questions people are not asking. You, know, you have to ask yourself, is the president in charge of this administration? That's why when the wife, the first lady, cried out last year, I said, look, some people have hijacked my husband's government, and I don't know these people. And uh, some people were, a lot of people clapped for her, but were those who were, uh, who attacked her very viciously. Now, how dare you strip your husband naked in public? Okay. But the woman complained at that time, had been totally vindicated, affirmed by the events that had unfolded in the last three months. Join us again after the break. So what is 60 Minutes with Angela all about? It's not an interview. I like to think it's a conversation between two people, people making the news, people who are in the news, and those who become the news. And the whole idea is to inform, to educate, or to clarify, as the case may be. It is an art getting people to answer the questions that everyone is thinking in their minds and that's what we try to do on 60 minutes with Angela I ask all the questions that everyone's thinking about and no one wants to voice all the questions you always wanted to ask you get those answers on 60 minutes with Angela every week on this station 60 minutes with Angela getting answers to every question you always wanted to ask Welcome back. My concluding moments now with Nusa Igebo. Tell says that they agree with the president that if we don't kill corruption, it will kill Nigeria. Yet, you say that it's not wise to devote all our energy to killing corruption at the expense of other critical challenges in our national life. How do you reconcile the two? It seems that there are two parallel lines that will never meet. If we don't fight corruption, it will kill Nigeria. Yet, you say it's not one of the critical challenges facing our nation. No, I, I, I don't see them as parallel lines. What we are saying is that fight corruption without turning Nigeria into a global laughing stock. Other countries fight corruption. Are they fighting corruption the way we are doing it here? Be with a lot of noise, a lot of razzmatazz, mm. at the end of the day, you don't get result. I mean, look at, you know, was it not la just last month here, uh, Justice Ademola was out of uh, all the 18 count charges that was brought against him. Yes. Remember, it was uh, one of those, uh, the DSS and raided uh, uh, you know, uh, mm. their homes. The 18 count charge that was brought in was himself and the wife, and the lawyer, this uh, Agi, uh, Barrister Agi, they were discharged and acquitted by the court. And remember, the defense did not even put up any defense. They, they, they made a no case submission based on the prosecution case and said, My Lord, they have no case. And they stated why. And the judge, the judge agreed with them. The entire 18 count charge was. But imagine the amount of noise that was made. Now, Miss, Miss, remember, before the trial, Mr. Sadimola was the head of the Lagos State Public Service. Yes. Once he was charged along with the husband, the poor woman had to step aside. Now he's back on our, on our seat. 
I said, of the Lagos to public service. Now, but there, the impression they gave us there was that, oh, this man, oh, he did this, he did this, he did that. Now, one of the most ridiculous things they did, the position did, was that, oh, among the things found in Justice Demolas House was two guns. Yes. And so he was charged with illegal possession of two uh, weapons. It turned out that the weapons, he had a valid license. For them. For them. And the EFCC never bothered, or the DSS never bothered to ask, okay, look, we found this gun you have, you have a license for it. Never asked. When the defense lawyer pointed this out, they said, oh, they forgot to ask the judge, the judge if he had a license for it. Okay. So, you know, and yet, yes. and yet, it was among the, the count that was brought against the judge. Are we then saying that President Buhari single-handedly wants to prosecute a war on corruption? But everybody else in his administration is not on the same page. No, with him. I, I, no I, I don't. I don't believe so. I don't. I don't subscribe to that. that this idea that it's only Buhari that wants to fight corruption. If he's the only one who wants to fight corruption in his administration, then he himself he should advise himself that he doesn't stand any chance. Because is he the one that will go and carry out the deal of the judge? Is he the one that will charge the cases to court? And that's why we have this agency. You have the police, the FCC, ICPC, the DSSS. If they, if they need. Uh, the DFS says to help them out in certain situations. But the, the problem, Angela, is not really, there's nothing wrong in the president fighting, fighting the, war. the war. No, no, You no. are not against no, the, no, 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 this no. war. No, we are not. It is the method, it is the approach, it is the noise. Like I said, there was matters. Yes. At the end of the day, you don't get anything. Now, uh, there were, I can give you other examples. If you remember, just the week Magu appeared before the Senate, the, last, the second appearance before the Senate, on the Wednesday or Thursday or so, the Monday of that same week, EFCC had issued a statement saying that they found about 43 million naira in cash loaded in bags, Ghana must go bags, at Kaduna Airport. Till today, Angela, the EFCC yes to tell Nigerians. Any other details about, about that it. money? Who brought this money there? Because they saw a brand new nose. From the wrap on the nose, you will know which bank those monies were taken from. And once you know the bank, you can trace from the records of the bank at what time this amount was withdrawn. withdrawn. Yes. That's one. Secondly, you said you found them at the airport. That they were already, they're going to put them on the carousel, the baggage yeah. carousel. If somebody checked in those bags, there should be a, a tag, you know, uh, on, on those bags. And from the tag, you will know who checked them in. Mm -hmm. And from from the record of the of, of the person who checked, you will know, you will know from who, the manifest. Exactly. Till today, all we're told, we found this money at the Kaduna Airport. Who brought the money there? Nobody knows. Have they done any subsequent uh, investigation to establish the fact? No. So do we lack capacity? Yeah, here? But, but again, they needed to feed the public to show them that you know we, see, we are working. We are working. You see, we are fighting this for against corruption. We are making sources of it. Then they said they found two hundred. Is it two hundred fifty million in Balogo Market? Yes, in Lagos. Like somebody said sarcastically, that when will the FCC stop playing the Nigerian public for fools? What do they do in Balogo Market? It's, it's one of the biggest markets in this country. They trade. They trade. And they, they trade not with uh, ATM cards. It's cash and carry. And in any case, you found this money in the uh, uh, market. In which shop did you find it? Who is the owner of this shop? See, today, they are not told us who they suspect. Now, you found the money in Balogun. Was it stolen money? Was any government agency looking for 250 two million? It was traced to Balogun market. The third one. They said the Air Force uh, shopping mall in Amadou Bello Way, Victoria Island. Yes. That they found another 50 something million naira in the Bureau of Change office. That was abandoned. Abandoned. Again, who is the owner of that Bureau of Change office where the money was so, so allegedly or supposedly abandoned? There are no names, there are no faces. But these figures are being thrown out by AFCC just to feed the public that is blamed for blood of those who have stolen the com our commonwealth and then. To tell us that you see we are succeeding in this war. The most ridiculous one is the Bodylon uh, Tower. Uh, oh, for I mean, Ikoi Gate. Ikoi Gate, uh, whatever. Thirty-eight million dollars, which later changed to forty-three million dollars. Remember, the first statement AFCC made was that we found the dollar component thirty-eight million dollars. When the Nigeria Intelligence Agency now come out and say, no, we own that money, and it's forty-three. It is now changed to forty-three. So if NIA did not say we own that money, what would have happened to the difference? Are people asking that question? That is the problem a lot of people have with the way the war is being fought. There is too much noise. How many people have been convicted in the last two years? How many have been convicted? But a lot of fantabulous 
charges are real out to the public. Oh, yes. this guy did this, this guy did that. But in most instances, because of poor investigative work, lack of thoroughness in the way the you know the uh, corruption agencies are doing their job. Sorry, quickly, let me also give you another example. Yes. Gus De Oribe, who was Minister of uh, Niger Delta under the previous administration. If you remember, the ICPC charged into court for diverting 1.9 billion naira uh, from the fund met for the e East West Road or Oroch yeah, the, Eket. Yes, that they diverted in collusion with some officials of the ministry and the construction company diverted 1.9 billion naira and it was charged to court. So at the last hearing of the court, what happened? The, the office of the attorney general wrote to ICPC that look, we've checked the money you, you claim was diverted. It's one of it's in one of the accounts in the banks of the ministry. In other words, nothing happened to the money. So what happened? So the ICPC, the prosecution had to withdraw. Are you saying the ICPC was prosecuting a case and the Attorney General had no knowledge of this? So the agencies are not even working together? That's the point, Angela. That's exactly the point. They went to court and said they were withdrawing the case against Arubebe and, and others. And based on that, he just subsequently discharged and acquitted them. But the poor man's name has been damaged. There are a lot of people who even didn't know what happened to that case now. You understand? But yes. He made banner headlines. Oh, this man, you see, we told you people are very corrupt. He diverted 1.9 billion and they didn't control the road. That is the problem with the anti-corruption war. This is why people are saying, be more professional, be more thorough, before you come to, to the public to make any pronouncement, yes. like the money you found in Kaduna Airport, do your investigation, establish the facts, establish faces behind the alleged crimes. So by the time you are informing the public, you have all the facts at your fingertips, you know? Yes. So you found for $3 billion, whose money is that? We still don't know. We still don't know. Did the government say it was it was looking for three million dollars. Could he could he find it and they found it at Kaduna Airport or Balogu Market or the Bureau of Change Office in VI and similar examples like that. There's too much noise making about the way they get caught. And as we speak now, the loopholes in the public service that enables this stealing have they been plugged? Has the stealing stopped? And those are the points that the Senate President, Bukola Saraki, raised yeah. in his speech at the launch of Senator Dino Melaye's yeah. book. I want to read some of those quotes to you. The Senate President says, I am convinced that we have favored punishment over deterrence. The key area of prevention is to make it difficult for stolen money to find a home. We must review our approaches by building our institutions to make it difficult for people to carry out corrupt practices. Sensationalization of the corruption war is unnecessary and counterproductive. You agree with him? Exactly, I agree with him. That's exactly what we are saying. Mm -hmm. Yes, we need to strengthen the institutions. For one, by investing a lot in capacity building. Sure. We lack capacity. We, yeah, we lack capacity. You know, and then you are giving the FCC, ICBC, and other agencies that you know fight crimes this uh, humongous, onerous task of fighting corruption. You know, and then they don't have the capacity with poor funding and, and all that. Do you support someone saying to me, these agencies should possibly be peopled by lawyers? Well, they say lawyers, I mean, why not? I don't, I disagree. Be because they will be able to, you know, ask the right questions. No, 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 I disagree because, I mean, take EFCC for instance. I mean, what capacity means that you need to train your people from top to bottom on law enforcement, on investigative, investigative methods, trying to build their skills at discovering yeah, things. forensic investigation, and that requires you know patience, thoroughness, and an eye for the for auditors yes. for details. These agencies are peopled by staff; they don't have enough staff with these kind of skills that are needed for this yes. job, you run into problems. And then, you see, like the AFCC and other agencies have been advised by people, including lawyers and judges, that look, why are you charging Angela to court? Or why are you slamming a 50 count charge against Angela? Why don't you look at all these counts? And maybe just Choose take two or three. Two yes. that you sure you know, you'll you know, get a concentrate yes. on finding the facts and the evidence to sustain those three or four count in that's, court. That's why in other crimes we see 
when they charge you with murder, yes. then you both agree and you, you plead guilty to yeah. voluntary you manslaughter. Mass manslaughter. You know, so you save time because they had they showed you they showed you evidence. Yes. Well you have you no know, this we know you did this, this how you did this, how you did it, this when you did it. Of course if the guy said, Well, look, I mean, I've been found out. So I have a, a chance to get a less severe punishment yes. by saving the prosecution and the state yes. a lot of time and, and money. money. So you plead back in from uh, first degree murder, you probably okay, mass slaughter. But you see, that is what is lacking here. We have these agencies running around like white dogs yes. in the forest looking for a kill. That is the whole. Oh, today we need to get a trophy in this war. So they arrange all. Uh, so you know, somebody has blown a whistle, there's money in uh, the <laughs> test communication office on the express. Yes. They go there and say, oh, you see, we found 20 million naira in the communication office. So you found money in my office. So what? Is your money missing? Is the government money missing? You understand? So that's why a lot of people, including myself, we have been very, very skeptical about the approach. But like I've said, I am not against the war, against corruption, no. On a final note now, in my introduction, I talked about how you said the president urge, the president's urge to protect close and loyal aides as all, at all costs is a sad commentary on the direction of the war. I want to give you a quote now. It is sad because it is at once a departure from the electoral promises of the president and the expectations of the electorate over how the nation shall be governed and the all-important issue of the president's presumed integrity end of quote presumed tell doesn't think the president has integrity where the integrity where in the first instance when the senate came out with the report on the sgf you dismiss it and on what basis you dismiss it okay only three of the members of the committee senate committee that investigated it did not sign that was the basis ignoring the, subs the substance of the report, you know. Again, because if you have integrity, and with this much vaunted integrity, and that report from the Senate, whether it was justified or not, they are saying, this is what we have found out your yes. SGF did. You think, I, I will, you will expect that the first thing the president would have done is sit down with that report, take a look at it, even engage with the Senate, how did you arrive at, 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 at this conclusion? If he's reasonably convinced that this guy has a case to answer, you suspend him. But the initial reaction was to defend Lawa against those allegations. And you said, no, no, I'm not going to sack him. He didn't do any wrong. He didn't do anything wrong, satisfied with this explanation. So that's why I asked Celia, what is the basis of the new position the president took? What uh, changed? What changed, exactly. So, so when people talk about, oh, the man, a lot of integrity, this, this, this. Oh, please spare me that. We are not interested in, I'm not interested in present integrity, whether I have integrity or not. I just want him to lead and get us results. Because they made a lot of promises. I said, you can do this. We can do this for you. We can make things, we can make Nigeria better. So, like I asked the last time, when you ask the average Nigeria in the street, are we worse off than we were two years ago? Or are we better off than we were two years ago? The answer is obvious. We are far worse off than we were two years ago before the APC government came into power. And is that your assessment of his, uh, this administration and the two years? Oh, I'm absolutely. I'm worse than I was two years ago in terms of my, my uh, expendable income, in terms of where my business is vis-a-vis -vis the economic situation in the country. Every indice you want to use. Security, are we better off than we were two years ago? We are more insecure today than we were in 2015. But we, we managed to recover areas that Boko Haram, where Boko Haram had hoisted their flags. Yeah. We the, lost a few local the, governments. No, no, you, give, you give a credit to that, but the recovery of those territories that Boko Haram controlled yeah. has started before this government came into power. So what the government did was to conclude that effort. And we give him credit for that. Yes, they are dealing with Boko Haram. But does that change the fact that today, in terms of security, we are worse off than we were two years ago? The kidnapping rate has increased exponentially. The herdsmen running wild all over Nigeria, and nothing is being done to check it. Every day you hear of cries from different communities, yes. in different parts of this country. You know, they are under attack by heavily armed and full of cattle herdsmen. And nothing is done about it. So that's why I said, are Nigerians worse off? Are we not worse off today than we were two years ago? Oh, put it on that way. Yes. So that people can have a chance to have answer the, uh, the question themselves. Are we better off now than we were two years ago? The answer is in the air.
Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Thank you Thank for you. sharing your thoughts with us Thank on you. the second anniversary of this president. And thank you for watching. I'm Angela Ajitmobi.